If you are interested in supporting the podcast and simultaneously supporting the welfare of your reptile at home, make sure you check out Custom Reptile Habitats for their premium enclosures. You can find an affiliate link in both the YouTube description or the show notes, or just head to animalsathome.ca slash CRH. If you use that link and head to their website to make a purchase, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that helps me support the show. Alternatively, you can join us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash animals at at home for as little as 75 cents per episode you can support the podcast and you will automatically be entered into the discord server so you can have conversations with like-minded keepers if you do bump yourself up to the five dollar per month tier you will have early access to episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests Hey there, welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning into this episode today. We are doing a roundtable discussion in this episode. It's been a long time since I've done a roundtable. I know I always talk about wanting to bring them back. They are a little more challenging, obviously, logistically and time-wise to edit and whatnot. But this was a topic we definitely wanted to have because maybe some of you are aware there was a little bit of controversy that went around in our reptile world or maybe just the online reptile space. And that was when Adam Wickens put out a video showing a cohab leopard gecko situation and it kind of blew up and snowballed into different things. And uh, he had that video come out. People were freaking out on TikTok, social media. Liam from Reptiles and Research, all of you guys know him very well, had a, had a great video just discussing some of the scientific research and evidence that supports that leopard geckos probably are in fact a social creature in the wild. So long story short, we brought Adam Wickens from Wickens Wicked Reptiles onto the podcast, Liam from Reptiles and Research, and Ellie Hills from Hills Herptiles, all to have a discussion about not only the situation that Adam was in, the cohabbing situation we discuss leopard geckos, why their evidence really does probably show that they are social. Some of the things that you can take into con- uh, into consideration when trying to cohab leopard geckos, but also we discuss at the end of the podcast, cohabbing just more broadly. How are some ways that you can cohab safely if you're somebody that wants to get into a cohab situation, the different types of cohabbing, how to actually use your own discretion as a keeper to figure out what, if what you are doing is safe or not. And there's so much more in this episode. It was a real a blast to have uh, all the three of them on the show today. So I know you will enjoy it. Let's jump right into the episode. Awesome. Well, Adam, Liam, Ellie, welcome to the podcast. First round table in a long time. So thank you guys for being here. No worries. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Uh, I'm excited to be back on the podcast. for the first, It was four years ago, Dylan, that we did this one. Crazy. It's crazy how time flies. Uh, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. 2020. It's amazing. What's And, and at that time, for anyone who's interested in my depression, <laughs> at that time... <laughs> I think Adam had less subscribers than me, <laughs> which is insane yeah. considering that you're like getting, you, you've, you've blown through a quarter million. I think you're like 300,000 plus, which is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Three, I think three thirty or something like that now. And, uh, I feel very lucky to be where I am and you know, it's a lot of hard work, but a lot of, a lot of luck also. And people like stupid bald guys who do top five stinky reptiles in their basement for some reason. So <laughs> I appreciate all of you who have ever watched. Yeah, well, obviously, you know the the quality of the videos are great, and the consistency is 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 huge. And just your you know the the ability to to present is is uh, pretty important. So you nail those those categories. So it, it's no surprise that the channel is doing so well. This is this episode of the podcast is kind of sparked on uh, some of the controversy we'll call it that's happened in the past, I guess, few few weeks or so. But in some ways, it's not that controversial. It's just turned into something that that. It made, almost made it more crazy than it really is. But I, so I want to break down some of these events, but I also want to use this opportunity to discuss cohabbing in general. We did a, a cohab roundtable, I want to say probably back in 2021, something like that. And it, I think it's a good topic. People are always interested in, in keeping reptiles together in the same enclosure. So I think the events that happened with your channel, Adam, recently, and, and the video that Liam put out as well, I think is just a, a perfect way to tie the, these topics together. So wh- why don't I, I'd love to just start for those who are, because there's a, probably a lot of people listening that are, are not aware of what happened because they may not be involved in the TikTok space or if they're just podcast listeners and don't end up on YouTube, then they wouldn't have seen this. Adam, can you kind of give us a rough timeline of, of, of events of, you know, for, from, from what you did to the video being released to it kind of culminating into this, uh, like barn fire basically. Yeah, sure. Uh, and first of all, I'll preface this with like, this has a lot to do with dubia and I have no hate towards dubia. So everything I say, I wish them all the luck in the world and this isn't like to crap on them at all. So basically Dubia approached me about a sponsorship. They sent me an enclosure and then we'll start at day one. Day one, I made a video. Uh, it was just about co-having leopard geckos making an enclosure basically for free. That video was out for 
two full weeks. And then a TikTok went out. Uh, a friend of mine, KJ, said, hey, bro, you're getting roasted on TikTok. Sent me the video. And then I called someone a dweeb in the comment section because they're being a dweeb. And uh, then after that, they got to Dubia. And then it was a full, let me remind you, two full weeks after the video was posted with 20,000 views on it. And then uh, Dubia very publicly pulled my sponsorship. And then there was a whole uproar about keeping leopard geckos together. And uh, the main basis was leopard geckos are solitary and territorial, which we know is not true. And then it just kind of spiraled from there. And then eventually another creator made a video uh, basically calling out my channel character and the whole thing. And uh, then now we're here talking about it. That's kind of how that works. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of went from like zero to a hundred really fast where suddenly it was all these different things are coming out and, and, and a lot of it was not fact-based in general. And then there's the whole side of the internet and it, how the internet behaves and mobs get created. And there's actually a lot of uninteresting discussions that are happening around the topic because people are just flip-flopping back and forth and kind of trading almost like blows. And uh, it, it became a little bit wild. So maybe, uh, I don't know if Liam or Ellie have anything to add to that with, with the timeline. Um, if you do, you can jump in now. If not, that's okay too. Um, other than just saying that I made a video talking broadly about co-having and the science behind before and against, and I tried to provide full arguments and counter arguments. And at the end of the video, then I gave my actual opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I just chucked that in the ring because I knew the views were flowing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was, a, there was a lot going on with the YouTube algorithm with co-having leopard gecko, so it was worth jumping on. Um, so, so that, and then, so Adam, can you tell us a little bit just about the, the geckos in general, the setup, how long you've been cohabbing gecko, the, those, maybe those specific geckos are just leopard geckos in general. Like what's your history there? Uh, sure. So I got into leopard geckos, I guess, 15 years ago. And then I think I kept saying in the videos, I've been cohabbing for 15 years. I, I correct myself. It's about 13 years. So two years after I put them together, I met someone who was from Pakistan who knew people who exported them and kind of explained to me, you know, cohabbing. And then I did some research and found some papers, including the one, well, maybe not that exact one, but similar papers to the con paper. So I realized that leopard geckos can cohab. So I started keeping them together about 13 years ago and they've always done great. And I've done, you know, two leopard geckos. I've always done it females only and then males just for breeding. And then sometimes I've kept four and then six I've kept as well in the same size enclosure. I've actually set this exact enclosure up before, just really never shown it because it wasn't that interesting to me. The cohab videos I've done in the past has the exact same information. They just never really got the views. So I didn't really think it was a big deal, which is why when people say, oh, you should have known it was going to be controversial. I thought, you know, a few people would think it was controversial, but to be this is... I don't know why, you know, it, it was never that before. So basically I set up the enclosure. It's a four by two by two enclosure. Uh, it has bricks and sticks and like basically structures that are to resemble what their natural environment looks like. It is an ugly enclosure to the human eye, like in comparison to the dart frog enclosure and excuse me, the uh, tree frog enclosure, which are in the same room. It's obviously very unappealing to us, but it's made for function uh, more than to look pretty. The geckos do great. There's four different heat spots in that enclosure, plus a basking structure that has three different layers of bricks. So it permeates the bricks at different temperatures, obviously, as you go down. It has a misting system to create dew. And then it has four different water stations and four different uh, feeding stations, two plus we put in crickets and then sometimes uh, roaches, if I can get my hand on discoid roaches, which you can't have dubious in Canada. And uh, that's basically the explanation of that. Uh, there's six leopard geckos, by the way, and these specific leopard geckos are all from the same mother um, and they're all about, I think it's four or six weeks apart, or I guess it would be six weeks apart. Um, so they're basically clutch mates kind of, and they were not cohabbed together, but now they are, they had their own enclosures until I put them together. Mm. And have you had any issues at all with that setup as far as behavior or animals getting picked on? Uh, the only animal getting picked on is uh, the short bald guy who does the <laughs> channel. But besides that, there's been no, issues no gangs are forming uh i've not heard any slurs yelled in the enclosure like everything's been great so far do any of them have tiktok accounts <laughs> uh no 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 no. Their, their iqs are all higher than their shoe size so we don't have to worry about that <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding i have a tiktok too it's just a yeah yeah <laughs> I made a TikTok for this whole thing to get in on it just to be able to view it. And then I <laughs> I post a few videos and I'm like, I got to get rid of this. I deleted it right away. So that's, I that's, never I never use it. I can't like I, I got addicted to Vine 10 years ago. I know TikTok would be the exact same. Yeah. So, yeah, there's just I'm too old for TikTok. I, I think it's passed me by. I know where I am. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you would, in, in, not necessarily in hindsight uh, of the whole controversy, but just in general, is there anything that you would change with that setup or that you might see as like, okay, that's a mistake, or maybe I would change this for doing it again? Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, in terms of the actual enclosure, I don't think I'd change anything about the enclosure, but I think in the initial video, I would have explained it better. And the reason I didn't explain it is because my videos are very casual, you know, like my other channel is literally called informal history. Like my whole thing is just, let's not beat things up. Let's not overthink things. So I think I would have explained the four heat spot or the uh, several heat spots. There's 11 different hides, by the way, uh, the water stations and all that stuff. Cause I, a lot of people said, Oh, there's nowhere for them to hide and there's no water. And if I explained it properly the first time, maybe that would have mitigated that. And then I probably would have put four geckos instead of six. And that's lit just, that has nothing to do with the geckos. I am comfortable with six. I just think that if it was four, it's just a smaller number and it probably wouldn't have blown up the way it is. So I just, those are the things that I would change. And maybe I would have added more sticks in the beginning. So I did add more sticks, to create more surface area, but otherwise, honestly, like I know that the, what the blowback is, but I'm pretty happy with the enclosure. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it does kind of remind me of, uh, and Liam will probably remember this better when Joseph from JBT Reptiles did some, or J, yeah, JTB Reptiles did something similar. I forget Liam, like he had, I think he had three geckos, but it was, remember the dimensions of that enclosure? It was less than a three by two by two. Right. So, so we yeah. are, I think it was a Viv Exotic, I might be wrong, but I knew the dimensions were just shorter or smaller than a three by two by two. It wasn't a true three by two by two. Mm hmm. And and he got a pretty similar backlash, but it was a totally like if you call yours more informal, his are very like it, like if anybody knows Joe, he's like gonna run through the entire like academic research, and it so it was very like clinical the way he did it, and I think it was a very similar backlash, wasn't it, Liam? Like he got people got really pissed at that video, even though he was bringing the peer reviewed into the video itself, and it, it didn't uh, it didn't really change the initial knee jerk response that people like are programmed to have almost. Well. He didn't get the response like obviously Adam did, just from sheer exposure. I suppose it's the ratio of channel size to reaction, I suppose. But he had a few people popping off in the comments and stuff. And then we made a video explaining it. And we made a collaboration back then about like cohabbing back then. Right, and he right. did it to explain his position, whether they should be uh, kept together and whether he thinks they're social or not. And that was in response to people. But I don't know how things went past then. I think he just didn't care at that point after that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he felt like he responded and that was it. Yeah. It it is a fascinating thing because it, it it's one of those no I mean, I remember with, with Joe as well, I remember he got sort of it, people lit him on fire for talking about uh, keeping on Kelsey sand. He did this video just describing how Kelsey sand, yeah, it's not the best substrate, but it's actually not what's killing your leopard gecko. Like if, if your leopard gecko is getting impacted by Kelsey sand or whatever we call it it's it's di dehydration issue like this, this stuff basically will dissolve in your in your gut and it, so if, if you actually are dying from that then you have a whole bunch of other things that you need to actually look at but he got lit up for that one too so th there are these myths in our hobby that people just hold on to and they're ready to like and, and I think social media obviously exasperates this issue where people want to attack and there's there's this that like there's something fun about being part of a mob and uh, like a you know t to attacking people that I think people get addicted to almost. Do you know what's funny is calcium Sam is is just calcium carbonate, right? And what did leopard gecko keepers do? Give them a bowl of calcium carbonate? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that you you really hit the nail on the head. I think it's this dogmatic thing where people just pick something to believe in and they don't really do the research. So for example, if your favorite YouTuber is Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, and I say to you, don't use reptile carpet, which I stand behind. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think you're a monster if you do, and I don't think you should be you know, canceled. But if you are someone who's new and you didn't do the research on why, and I just say that and you trust me, then you're going to think, okay, it's always bad. It's always bad. There's no way to use it properly. I think it's the same thing with Kelsey sand, right? Because I think it's a good idea to tell new keepers that calcium sand is probably not the best substrate. Because again, you can run into dehydration issues because you're new. Maybe that's going to happen to you because you're not supplement or giving water in the correct way for leopard geckos. For example, leopard geckos often use droplets to drink. If you're not giving them a human hide that collects the droplets and they're not, they can't find standing water, that sort of thing. But I don't think that it's always bad to use calcium sand. I just think it's a good idea to stay away from it unless you're maybe mixing it or you actually know what you're doing. And I just think that people get on a team and it's team never go have ever. And they've never done a stitch of research, like not one lick of research ever. 
It's just someone told them that now it's in their head. They know because they know, but they don't know why they know. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I think Liam and I might have had this conversation a couple of weeks ago. And this is something that I've noticed before as well, where I see people getting into an argument on Facebook group and then suddenly my podcast is referenced for one of the sides. And, and you can see within that comment stream that the person who's referencing the podcast actually only has like a very vague grasp of what they're saying. But because they saw it on the podcast, it's, it's, a, it's like a slam dunk point. And Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's an element of learning that, you know, you have to start with, okay, these are the facts that somebody who, an expert has told me, you know, not me being the expert, but the guest, whoever was on is the expert. You know, you can, that's your starting point. And then there's the, there's the learning aspect of understanding how those elements interact with, with your care. But it, it, it is a dangerous thing when somebody just takes the, the one point from one person and then that's their that's their their ammo for everything without actually taking the next step of maybe reading those papers or understanding how that actually interacts with with the rest of their system so it that's one of the problems with putting stuff out on the internet it, it's kind of i, mean, I had it on tiktok recently mm. where um i said about um being a dragons can have substrate right it doesn't cause impact. You know, it's a husbandry issue is what I said. And someone replied to me and was like, um, actually, I think you should read this article on Reptifiles. And it was an article on impact. And I opened it and it was just the funniest thing ever because I replied and said, just scroll up and see you wrote that. Because <laughs> I wrote it. And it was about like how <laughs> calcium, it was like how <laughs> impact isn't about substrate. <laughs> so she cited that, cited myself against me to say that it was not even what the article said. She never replied, but it's, oh. it's it's so funny how people can like not even realize what the article is even saying, but then somehow draw like a thing out of it that's not even what it was intended to say. Mm-hmm. I, well, I think they're reading the headline. I think that's kind of common uh, amongst everywhere on every social media platform. But just to your point, there's a veterinary, like veterinarian, not a vet tech, a veterinarian who specializes in exotics. And I asked him once, he's been doing this for 10 years and he works at the, the biggest um, hospital, like, uh, emergency clinic in Ontario. He said he's never seen a bearded dragon with impaction ever. Not one, not ever. He sees bearded dragons every single day. But just to your point of people getting to points and then they just, that's the point because that person said it. I think it's also shooting the messenger rather than the message. I don't think that most of those people who had a problem with me had a problem with leopard geckos because some of them didn't even know that you shouldn't or shouldn't uh, put leopard geckos together in the first place they just were mad at me because someone who they like was mad at me someone they respect had something to say about me so therefore they're on their team now and they're just going to jump on me and i think that was more of the problem than anything else so people just say okay well never cohab because this person said i'm mad at this person i don't even care what it's about this person's mad at them so therefore i am too and i think that's kind of like the base of this entire thing yes yeah 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 and there's another element of experimentation that I'll talk about in a second that I think is sort of an underlying issue here. But I, I was curious if Ellie or Liam, did you have anything when you looked at Adam's setup, is there anything that you would do differently or, or, or things that you would change? Um, I would probably have like the walls as like one big reach stack. I don't know if you ever saw like Joe's enclosures back in the day where he put like cork like in like a complete reach stack along the walls. I feel like if that enclosure was like the walls were completely that, I feel like in terms of surface area, that is like massive by comparison to like Mm -hmm. volume, if that makes sense. So I think if you completely went overboard, um, if you can call that overboard, some people might say that's just completely like necessary, but I think you like strengthen your position by, uh, by doing that. I think, what about you? I think um, for like an initial enclosure, I was quite happy with it because when you're adding like permanent structures like the reed stacks and things, the way that you've set it up, you can access all of the geckos because what you wouldn't want happening is not being able to find them all whilst you're initially setting them in. So I think that's a good like maybe next step. But initially I thought that was, yeah, I didn't see any issues. And because it was bricks in a reed stack, it was like hollow chambers all the way through, wasn't it? That means that no leopard gecko can be cornered essentially because it's always like open either end. That's also something, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, that was the whole point too. And I agree, like I could definitely do that. So again, I'm not <laughs> coming down on Dubia, but those enclosure walls are not meant to have anything stuck to them for sure. So especially with that enclosure, because I was trying to show that enclosure off. I mean, yeah. maybe it would work, but I've done a lot of enclosures where you do some sort of foam or you stick something in the background. Like I've done a lot of videos like that. This enclosure is not meant for that. So I don't think it would work 
for that enclosure. But I do agree that a rock or even if it's cork or whatever around the walls, first of all, it would look better aesthetically. And I think that was people's problem. And second of all, I think they would add way more surface area as well. So I don't, I know, I don't know why it does a thumbs up thing. Uh, so I, I do agree with you there. It just, this was a video too, where it wasn't supposed to be blase or lazy. It was just some people work 80 hours a week, but still want to keep a gecko. And you shouldn't have to, you know, like, for example, Tanner Surfe, if you watch one of his videos, I don't think he's a gatekeeper at all. But if you watch one and you think this is the only way to set up animals, you'll never get an animal because like I put so much work and there's other ways to do it that aren't going to look as good. Tanner's Tanner is the best of the best. There's not, not even a close second in my opinion, but you don't have to do that in order to have a health, happy and healthy animal. And if you're okay with a pile of sticks and bricks looking in your living room, wherever you keep your animal, I think it's perfectly fine for these animals and they are happy and healthy because not one of them has complained that they're, uh, they don't like the interior wall color or anything like that mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly didn't cause offense in my opinion to me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't, I didn't see that and go, Oh, gasp. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Liam's like, I, I really agree with Adam on this. And it's crazy how much he's getting roasted for this. And I, and then, then it sent him off on the, I'm going to make a response video. And I, I want to talk about that in a second. So Liam can kind of break down some of those points. Cause I think they were, again, it was a really well done video, but the, the, the other point that I wanted to make, and I think this is something I've talked about on the podcast before. And it's one of the issues. I think this is a social media related thing is that we have created an environment within herpeticulture where experimentation is totally banned. Like you are not allowed to do that. So anybody that's that's kind of on the on the peripheries of what we consider like the quote unquote best version of care, like anybody that's experimenting a little bit, you almost have you almost can't tell anybody because as soon as you do, you get this this mob come after you, and it's 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 a shame actually because then we have this static ho hobby that there's no learning taking place. You you can absolutely experiment with your animals in a safe way that doesn't immediately put danger you know put them into danger. It, it doesn't mean like okay I'm going to try to free roam six geckos in my house and hopefully they come out for their you know crickets in the morning. It's you know th there are different ways to do things that are within safe parameters that will actually expand the hobby and push us forward into new areas that a static status quo will not ever allow for and it's it's kind of a shame but that's like you do things like very different than what most people would keep like frogs and stuff and like most people would be like that's absolutely unacceptable but like it's actually better in your subs than i've seen on most people's yeah, I um, keep frogs in mesh enclosures, and I know a lot of people would see that as a massive red flag, but the standing humidity in my bedroom is 70%. So, like, in order to get those really nice spikes, um, that I can really miss these enclosures, and then it just all kind of, like, evaporates away. Um, and trying to keep them in glass enclosures, I wasn't giving them really nice, like, rain chamber effects. And, yeah, I haven't had any issues. I've covered the size with bamboo. It looks really nice. They're a lot bigger than I could provide in glass. Um, but yeah, I, I don't tend to air it very much because, yeah, I know people will have a problem with it. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. I mean, Adam will know this. In North America, I mean, this is changing now, but it, even five years ago, a chameleon had to be kept in a screen cage or else it would just implode and die. <laughs> but then you look at Europe and everybody's <laughs> using exoterra, especially for the smaller smaller species. And it's like, okay, how come they can do it? But then over here, it's just like one of those rules that if you don't follow, you're going to get destroyed online for it when all it takes is looking, like you said, Ellie, looking at your room. It's like, okay, if your humidity is actually 70 or 80%, you probably don't need to use a glass enclosure or, or you, you could well, I guess, no, sorry, the opposite. If, you're in, if your humidity is down to like 20 or 10% like I get in the winter, probably a screen enclosure is probably not the best idea for that animal. So there is nuance with every keeper, but we create these hard line things and it, uh, yeah, it's, it's not the best. What's interesting too is even, so I wouldn't consider myself an expert on all species, of course, but I've done enough research on chameleons and I thought until last year that, yeah, of course, let our, uh, chameleons go in screen enclosures. And then I spent the week with Bill Strand or two weeks with Bill Strand. And he kind of educated me on one bus ride of why, how, how ridiculous that is that, you know, just that statement. And I guess it makes sense. So it can get everybody. I thought that, and I research animals for a living, like this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, so I can only imagine that if this is just your casual, of course you would think certain things because it's been beat into your head by so many different sources or even just one source that you really trust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's so much dogma, and it forces you into these like dogmatic lanes of thoughts to the point where if you even like think outside those lines, like you don't even think to. 
like there was um someone with a ball python in in, in a rack and they upgraded the size of the rack um and the ball python um was really snug in the first tub and it was like hugged by all the walls and then when it went up to a bigger one it didn't touch the walls anymore and everyone was like oh it's because it's got too much space well i looked at that and was like <laughs> well it had the snugness and now it doesn't and I was like, try and give it a hide because it's that thing my taxes and that feeling of close contacts that that's what's missing now. And she responded to me and said, the 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 rack is the hide. So mm. because she would not leave that dogmatic lane of thought, she could not assess her own issue with like a clear mind. And I feel like that happens in all these instances of leopard geckos. Like they're in these dogmatic lanes of thoughts or whether it's like the leopard geckos or chameleons have to be in screen or they have to be in glass, whatever way you pick, but there's no like leeway or thinking outside those lines because people have been channeled into it like cattle. Mm -hmm. And like people don't question. So a lot of the examples that you get of leopard geckos not working um, in cohabitation are like really extreme examples of like, Oh, there were like 10 in a two by 18 by 18 and they ripped each other to shred. Therefore it will never work. And it's like, well, if you kept two dogs in a crate all day, they'll kill each other. Like mm -hmm. you can't, you have to look at the source and be like, well, maybe the reason why it didn't work wasn't just that. And the same with like husbandry, like substrate. It's not the substrate. It's a broader picture. We kind of need to look at that before we kind of make our really dogmatic what you yeah. just said is the entire argument right there. That's the entire thing because that's, well, we know this because I've seen pictures, you've seen pictures, we've all seen pictures of leopard geckos ripping each other apart. Okay, were they in my enclosure or were they, just like you just said, were they in an enclosure that, say, is 20 gallons and there's five or six of them in there and it's the wrong temperature and they're on the wrong substrate and they're never being cleaned out and they don't have a heat grate? Like, it's a different thing. If you put a bunch of prisoners together in a small jail cell and there's nowhere to go to the bathroom, then they're all going to be a little bit irritable and probably want to fight each other. If you put a bunch of people into a room and it's a buffet and everything's free and it's nice, at, like you understand it's very different depending on what you, how you actually set it up. So mm -hmm. what you just said, I think, is the entire argument. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also individualism as well. You, could, you can just have one gecko who's just a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, again, I think, because we're all kind of part of the same generation. We're all roughly the same age. I, I, Liam and Ellie are a little younger. I think, Adam, are you a 91 baby or what are you? 92? 91. 91. Okay, so we're, we're both 91s. So we're kind of, you know, experiencing reptile keeping. Maybe the early days, the internet was pretty weak. But, you know, especially in the last 10 years, we, this is our experience where, you know, if you go back the generation before, it would be like, let's meet at the HERP meeting talk about what you're doing and then you don't see them again for six weeks and then you might come back and say, hey, I tried this. I, this is something I did and you know, th there's that air of experimentation and, you're, and sharing ideas with each other rather than constantly you know, keeping tabs on what everybody's doing. And I think just that in general allowed people to be comfortable experimenting and trying different things and figuring out different ways of care because obviously the goal is not to just try different things. The goal is to try different things in an attempt to make the care better, to make the welfare of the animal higher. And that's what we're attempting to do, where if we don't allow wiggle room, then this just doesn't happen. Well, there's another big difference, what you just said too, because at a hurt meeting, if you go and meet, or even at a, at a reptile expo, how many screening matches do you see at reptile expos? Exactly. Not none. none. Or next to none. It's because you're face-to-face. -face. People who attack me, or basically just using this as an example, people who attack me for this whole thing on the internet, and were literally calling me names, do you think for a second they would have that exact same discourse in person? No, they would have a civil discussion because you're in person. It's just easy to hide behind a keyboard or in some cases go on Instagram, block somebody and then talk all the smack in the world because then they can't defend themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's just different then than it is now. And now people are very comfortable being absolute dickheads to each other. And I think that's just because of the internet. I just think that's the way it is. Yeah. Liam, do you want to break down some of those points that you made in your video, if you can remember them, because I think they were, it was a really well done video. You know, you had, it, it, one of the things that I had said to you afterwards is it's interesting that people chose leopard geckos to attack Adam for considering that's got to be one of the species with the most amount of scientific, uh, actual academic white papers there are. You know, it's just, it's a very popular pet. There's so much research on it. The, the papers that you pulled out for that video were just like, how is there a paper on that? Like it, it just like made a point perfectly. And there also happened to be like peer reviewed academic research to it. So do you, do you want to run through some of it? If you can uh, 
pull it off the top, or we'll just cut oh, the whole video all, into this part. I was working part. off a script. Yeah, yeah. I was working <laughs> off a script. So don't, right, of course, of course. So, it's funny you say that because I, I feel that there's not enough in terms of like not on husbandry, but mm. because of um, temperature, sex, termination, and like, incubation of eggs, obviously suddenly the leopard gecko became a guinea pig for researching that exact topic. So there's a, like a huge like slurry of papers on that exact topic. And then when it comes to husbandry, less so. But again, when it comes to researching husbandry in general, you tend to what's cheaper to do is to take a species and use it as a proxy and apply it to everything else. So like the corn snake was like heavily researched for snakes because cheap and easy to access. Lapi gecko, cheap and easy to access. Bearded dragons, cheap and easy to access. So you tend to find that you get species overly studied because it gets used as a, a proxy to being used as like a to draw comparisons from. Um, but I still don't think there's enough. But there, basically, the uh, one that also uh, Adam was referring to as well in his responses to a lot of people was a herpetological write-up of what was found in the wild. They found them in brick walls in the wild. Um, I think it's Dr. Mohammed Sharif Khan, I think. Yep, don't right. quote me on that. I made a video. I said it perfectly the first time. But he... He detailed like uh, diagrams of like this rock wall and where the chambers were in between because it was a rock wall that I had made, but then had mortar in between. But over time, the mortar had like rotted away, I guess, and then left chambers in between the rocks. And he mapped out like what where the entrance holes were, and and that they had a communal latrine they would all go to, and he described how they would all like commune there and disperse out into the night, hunt separately, but then always come back to the same place and sleep together on the same ledges and things like that. So there was also papers that describe things like they did a maze task in captive leopard geckos where they used markers to get them to navigate these mazes and when they would change and change these markers the leopard geckos would adopt their strategies showing that it's um they're in the moment changing and changing strategies and stuff and they are using spatial mapping and decision making to like use a higher function to navigate these mazes so the, the argument i made then was like how come they uh they can navigate a maze task with changing markers and everything. But if they were to go out in their environment, which is pretty static for the most part, and use like this tree and different landmarks and different things to map their spatially map their environment, that if they were really stressed by being near each other, why did they ever come back? Because surely are we really gonna make the argument that there's only one human microclimate or one safe space in that entire hillside or that entire habitat? Like it doesn't make sense unless you look at the fact that there is an evolutionary advantage to being together, i.e. social behavior, or the fact that they use communal nest sites. Like, I raise the point of, well, how come they don't destroy each other's eggs and guard that nest site as a valued resource? Or even eat the other person's eggs, or the other gecko's eggs, shall I say, because it's highly nutritious and that fuels the development of your own eggs. Unless there's an ev evolutionary advantage to not doing that, a.k.a. social. And I don't, I can't really think of an advantage for that unless you start thinking about social behavior yeah. um and i made some other points as well but I'm, i can't remember yeah it, <laughs> it, it was just it was so well done like every point that you made was like yeah it, it really does build the picture of them being social i mean there's plenty of examples of other animal species not just reptiles that will devour the young or destroy the eggs of of common of, of the same conspecific right the same species just because of the evolutionary mechanism to uh, have your genes to be the one to survive is more powerful than you know having a social premise for the for the society so it is it is very interesting like i said there was there was enough in my opinion to have a video enough research to to paint a pretty solid picture that they are a social animal in the wild and i think all obviously in captivity keeping them in a social setting and not seeing limbs torn off as long as the the se the setting itself is appropriate is also a pretty good piece of evidence that you can use you know adam do you, do you pay attention to like behavior do you do you use any cues for like something that might be stress or you know an animal not eating or anorexia like are you co kind of co constantly watching their behaviors and their their weight to make sure that they're not overly stressed 
I'd like to take a quick break to thank today's show sponsor, Tamascus Limited. Many of you are probably already familiar with Tamascus as the founder has been on the podcast before. That's Thomas Griffiths. Last summer, we did a podcast called The Fundamentals of Lighting. And if you are any way confused by lighting, you must go listen to that episode because we break it down in very simplistic terms. Tamascus is an independent animal and husbandry consultant as well as a research and development consultant. Thomas works behind the scenes to help improve lighting technology for everything from just a keeper like you and I all the way up to really high level zoos. Thomas has an incredible amount of experience from testing lighting technology all the way to actually making sure it's implemented properly in the field, which makes him uniquely positioned to give lighting advice for animals in captivity. He works with all taxa ranging from small reptiles and amphibians all the way up to large mammals. He is trusted by zoos, vets, and the world's leading manufacturers. This allows him to offer professional and friendly advice tailored specifically to your needs, knowledge, and budget. Tamascus also covers continued professional development and training for those of you who work in a pet store, a vet clinic, or a zoo environment, and all advice given is protected by insurance. Thomas is available for both in-person and virtual consultations. If you're looking for more information on Tamascus, make sure you head to tamascus.com. That is T-O-M-A-S-K-A-S.com. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't use a scale. I'm not going to tell you I weigh every one of them every day, but for the first month, every single day, it was just, it, it's just a few bricks, right? So I just, just move the bricks. And there's like a fun thing to do with the kids. All right, let's look at the geckos today, right? And then you look and see, make sure that no one's, you know, losing weight. I've been re- reading geckos for a long time. I know what it looks like when a gecko is losing weight, especially from things like breeding. So you take a look, they all looked fine. In terms of stress, sometimes you'll see them out during the day for short periods because I have a UVB light and sometimes they'll just bask in UVB and they'll go back down to one of their nesting sites. But also I've noticed that Almost all of them use the exact same hides every single day. And a lot of them, every single one of them is with a, another gecko. So even though there's 11 hides for these geckos, they all use uh, communal or at least with two, but sometimes three or four geckos in the same hide, depending on the size or where it is. So, and I've looked and there's spots that are the exact same temperature as one that's inhabited by four geckos. And it's exactly the same temperature on the other side of the enclosure with no geckos in it. So I don't think it's, Oh, well, of course they are because you're not giving them enough heat spots. Like That's not it. I think that there has to be something that is, like Liam said, a, some sort of social benefit of them being together. So I definitely look for it, and I'm not a behaviorist or a scientist, but I, I think that I know enough now that I would be able to see if they were stressed, they stopped eating or whatever the case is, and I've seen nothing like that. Mm-hmm. So what would your threshold be for you to like take one out, like it stops eating or losing weight or – yeah, if one of them stopped eating, for sure, I would immediately take it out. And the nice thing, too, is the, that enclosure is in the living room. So, like, the kids are upstairs watching TV right now. They're watching the geckos. Uh, my fiance's up there. She knows about geckos. I, we eat right beside them. It's right beside the dinner table. So we're watching all the time. There's people there. And if I ever saw a gecko, say, chasing another gecko around, I would investigate that immediately. Or if I saw one of the geckos was always out, not in a hide, or, you know, looked emaciated, I would then immediately remove that gecko or if there was a problem gecko, remove that one. But it's not like I don't have a bunch of enclosures. I, my house is a zoo. I have tons and tons of area to put these guys and separate them if need be. And this isn't a money saving thing. It's just, I think that it's beneficial and that's why I did it. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that really frustrated me was when people were saying that in the wild they had, they could get away if something happened. And that's not necessarily true because they're obviously in that compact environment hiding because it's during the day and they know if they leave that hide, there's a predator and that is the fear. And whilst it's in captivity, your leopard geckos know if I run out of this hide and I go over that log, there's nothing the other side of that log. And I think we forget the same as like when a pheasant crosses a road, why does it turn back the other way and run in front of the car again? It's because it doesn't know what's in the head on the other side. And it's the same with the leopard gecko. Our captive leopard geckos know that there is nothing in that enclosure that's going to eat them. So if it wants to get away, even during the day, it can. Whilst it's in the wild, they literally, their their choice would be life or death. If I stay here or if I risk my life, I'm going to have to go out there and face whatever's out there. So I think it's, I do get what they're saying about, oh, the world is vast. It is, but we're forgetting they are a little tiny prey item for a lot of their life. So, yeah. I think Liam hit that in his video too. And I think that he articulated it. You articulated it even now better than I ever have in any of these arguments. If I ever needed to do a debate, you guys can do it for me because that was so well put. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I think that's the, that is such a a great example of 
They're little prey items. They're not just in the wild, just scurrying around carelessly like they can in captivity. In captivity, it's a much better environment. I think a lot of these people think that, oh, well, you know, they get sick and then their their uh, mommy and daddy and, and kid leopard geckos come and on their bedside and feed them. Like, that's just not how it is. In the wild, it's much more brutal. And what I have set up is much better than any leopard geckos ever lived in the wild in the, in the history of Everton. Mm-hmm. I think people don't give them the credit they deserve and like the level of condition as well. Like assuming that they, they don't know there's not a predator in their tank. Yes, they might get scared because they see you moving around in, in the living room and stuff and they don't know what that is and that might be like scary to them. But once they've done a, like a hundred laps of that enclosure, they, 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 they know there's not a predator in there. You know, they're not stupid. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And Liam, was there another piece of evidence it was something to do with maybe like clutch size or egg size or something that uh, that was it was like something to do with the multiple males, but like potential mates that had to do with egg health? Do you remember that or am I making that up? So there was um, males would be more interested in a, like a unfamiliar female, but males could dis- did could associate to familiar females so they knew who individual females were mm. but, but you might have a different species that if there's no social aspect to them at all they only really need to dis- discern between sex like is that a guy or a girl yeah, yeah but yeah. the fact that the echoes can be like oh i know you you and you like between these different females and then have a preference for the new novel one i said it could show that they're, they're making their way around the colony, do, like making sure they're not just doing the repeat one. Yeah, yeah. But then there was another one that showed that uh, sperm from an unfamiliar male increased clutch size and fertility of the female. So that might be that when they when they do go out and disperse, that like an unfamiliar male that doesn't have his own colony um, might mate with a female, and then she takes it back to that colony, and that stops inbreeding within that colony. So. I think it definitely can be more like socially complex and what we ha- what happens during the dispersals. I mean, we know loads of different species do that, like cuttlefish will do that, and there's loads of other examples. You probably know more than me about that, but I think we just don't... I think there's strong evidence that they are social and that they do live in colonies. I just don't think we know like a lot about what they do in the wild around those colonies and how the networks between different colonies work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's... absolutely conceivable that keeping a leopard gecko solitary could actually have a negative impact on it. If if you're talking about a social animal, I mean, that's why you see people with birds is that they, you shouldn't have one bird. I mean, I I don't keep birds, so it's, or it's been a long time, but I I do remember that being a thing. And most, I I think, I think in lots of rodents and even in some countries, like you're, you have to buy more than one because they are social. So there is like this negative impact of putting a social creature into a solitary environment might not be the best thing. Now, maybe for reptiles, it's it, being solitary, if, if you are slightly social, isn't the worst thing in the world. But it's not inconceivable that that could be the case, that having a social animal in a non-social environment could be bad. And, and you know, it, it would be, there, there's lots of, and maybe we'll get Ellie to chat about this in a second, but there are many different species of, of small geckos and other things that are pretty much always sold in a bundle as a, as a, as a, as a social you know, group. And no, almost nobody would buy one of those just one because of that reason. You would you know that they do better in groups, and not enough people do it with leopard geckos to have it go one way or the other. Or when they do do it, like we had already mentioned, they're putting it in the small tub, and it, it becomes chaos really quickly. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I think he's waiting for you, Ellie. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah sorry. sorry, I didn't direct you, Ellie, but maybe maybe you could just give us a little bit of because you before we started recording, you had mentioned a couple of the different species that you do work with, and maybe you could just m- mention your experience with those and what they are, and uh, you know whether or not you would actually try experiment with keeping one at a time. Yeah, so I have um, a group of Stenodactylus, Stenodactylus, which are um, the common name is like June geckos. Um, and I also have a group of viper geckos. And I inherited these. Um, I had inherited the stenos with a viper gecko in there. <laughs> and so, wow. and they have lived in this community for years. He's kept them together for years before I took them on. Um, and you, you watch them that he had every choice to go in like different hides and different places and things like that. Um, and they always chose to be social together. I have now since bought him his own colony to go and he is not in there anymore um but you watch them as um their social groups they're like they approach each other one will go lower one will go higher there's lots of like tail wiggling happening so 
the just the enrichment of continuously like communicating with each other i can hear them squeaking to each other at night <laughs> like um mm. i can't imagine taking that social animal and just keeping it in a separate group like just on, not a group but you know just on their own when i consider like all day long i will watch them and they're just changing positions like checking in on each other they'll go in the same hides as each other they're laying communally together so then to think yeah just having one on its own would be really sad mm-hmm. i remember i saw them in the, like a big dog pile and it with amongst these stenos the viper gecko was in the middle of it like in, in the middle of the dog pile <laughs> but it just shows that individual viper is craving so like socially because he joined that dog pile he could have gone to the other end of the enclosure and been in one of the many hides but he joined that dog pile of like sleeping in a big pile but also what was really interesting was that he was also there during breeding seasons and he was never removed and neither were any of the young so he was in there with all of these little young and he still didn't touch anything so he can't it was almost like he believed he was a steno himself yeah, that's what i was gonna <laughs> say yeah this whole time he's like what i'm what you're kidding me <laughs> yeah. but like scorpion geckos are so this is, this is the point i made in the video as well scorpion geckos are social but they can like bite each other or kill each other or rip each other's tails off but like like advanced keepers will keep them social and we know they're social they have like complex tail wags and flicks up of the tail and things like that but the point i made in the video was let's say it was reversed right and uh scorpion geckos were just as as accessible as leopard geckos and leopard geckos were this new rare species that came into the hobby. It would be the advanced keepers or intermediate keepers that took to that because that interested them. And you would have loads of issues with beginners keeping the scorpion geckos and loads of fights happening. And the advanced people would keep them the leopard geckos and keep them social and having no issues. And the narrative would be, oh yeah, leopard geckos are social, but don't you keep them scorpion geckos together? So it's almost as if exposure equals greater risk of accidents happening just by having like, the beginners having the most access to them. But it, that doesn't mean that that, that isn't what the, the species is. Yeah, it sort of becomes a, a prob- it becomes a function of probability of that group of, or that species being subjected to poor husbandry. And the more the wider that species is available, the more likely you're going to have the the random person who doesn't exactly know what they're doing make mistakes. And then if they're trying to, they have bad husbandry and they're trying to cohab, it's going to equal bad result. But if you do have an animal that's more rare, more expensive, those are going to be automatically, you know, reserved to the intermediate and advanced keepers. And they're much less likely to make husbandry errors. And then you're more likely to see the actual natural behaviors of those animals within a, you know and if it's in the parameters of a social group then you're going to see successful so- social and cohab keeping rather than you know the gladiatorial battles you might see on uh, you know crusty <laughs> leopard geckos that haven't had water or anything for 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 months i think it's yeah. a great point <clears throat> that he made too that Liam made because i think it's just fundamentals let's call it right you're a swimming coach right so you teach fundamentals and then maybe you change, I don't know anything about swimming, but maybe you change your form as you get into an advance, right? So for example, a baseball swing, you teach a kid how to do it. And then your everyone's body is different. So you adjust per person. I think it's the same thing with species, right? You teach fundamentals. You don't keep leopard geckos together if you're brand new because you don't know what to look for. Maybe you didn't sex them right, whatever, whatever. And then five or six years or however long that you actually understand the gecko, then you can adjust it. Okay, well, these geckos can be together because of this, because they're the same size, they're the same age, they're in an enclosure that's set up properly. I understand what to look for as a keeper. They have the water, they have everything that they need. So I think it's just you teach the fundamental and then people get attached to the idea and then it never changes. And then I think people don't understand that the reason that you're taught this in the first place isn't because it's the only way. It's just the best way for new people to do it. And then you can advance. There is a way to advance. People just... I think are dogmatic and this is the way it is because it's the way it is and there's no other way to do it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's about like, I wouldn't be comfortable cohabbing leopard geckos without knowing their history because we know that incubation by temperature is a thing of determining if they're male or female, but we can get those females that were temperature just slightly too um, more towards the male and then you get rather high testosterone females that are probably more prone to aggression and also when we have hear stories of these males attacking the females in the tank is it that that male has stumbled upon a high testosterone female and has got really confused like i personally would have done what adam's done and like raised those animals myself i know that i've temperature correctly 
incubator for female and things like that they're a lot more complex than i think we give them credit for and i think those kind of things are also popping up and oh maybe that's why you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a great point i mean there's so much nuance and it, it does take the finesse of a very engaged keeper to pull off some of these things and and i that's that's one thing that i uh, an analogy that chaz from snakes and adders use and i think i really like it it's like the belt system in in uh, martial arts you know you start with your white belt because if you start trying to do the purple or black belt things as a white belt you're either going to hurt yourself or like seriously hurt somebody else because you don't know how much pressure to put on a joint or you know you don't teach a white belt an arm bar because they'll just break somebody's arm by accident because they actually don't understand like how sensitive that is so you you, you exactly like you're saying adam you start with those fundamentals and then you build up from there and and i don't keep leopard geckos and i don't have a ton of experience with them but they also have social interactions with each other right i don't know if you see that in, in the enclosure adam but maybe you could talk about it if you do see it i mean you see tail wagging and whatnot yeah, and it's not even really between the females. There's not much tail wagging that I see. When you're in a breeding situation, that's a whole different thing. But from what I from what I see is they just kind of they kind of look at each other, and that that I forget the exact term that uh, Liam was talking about in the video, where one will look a certain way and then the other one looks that way. I see that all the time. And I didn't know what to call it. Liam, what it called? Do you remember? Uh, the papers called it gaze following. Okay, gaze following. So I see that a lot, quite a bit. And then they'll just kind of look at each other in the same way that Ellie was describing stenos, which I also keep and will attest I would never keep them alone. That would be silly goose stuff but based on what I see. They'll kind of look and go, you know, one's a little higher, lower. They'll they almost like lick each other in the face or the butt or the back, whatever. There's never any biting, even nipping that I've ever seen. And then they'll just kind of move around each other or maybe over top of each other. But it's not like bearded dragons where one's waving into the one's head bob. I don't see anything even remotely like that. There's no aggression that I can see. And a lot of it is just them being social in that they are together sleeping during the day. And then when I turn the lights on at night, they just look around and sometimes they're together and sometimes they're not. And the only tail wagging that I see is when they're hunting. And in my opinion, from what I see, that's not directed towards each other. That's directed towards, I'm trying to catch this food and this is my behavior, whether I'm in a tub by myself in an enclosure by myself or in a group of geckos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to spend a little bit of time just discussing cohabbing in general. Like we can move off the leopard geckos and, and discuss some other species. Because I, I know there's so many people that are interested in this topic and they, and they actually want to experiment it with themselves, whether that's, you know, cohabbing the same species together or actually making like a multi-species thing. Is, it, is there anything else anybody wants to say about the leopard gecko cohab or just leopard gecko situation in general? Or I just thought it was really hypocritical. <laughs> I thought so too. And I, I just think that uh, <clears throat> on the same platform that admonished me, uh, there are pictures of six leopard geckos in a breeding colony in a 28 quart tub. And nothing was said about that. So I think the entire thing was disingenuous the way that it was presented. And I think that uh, nobody actually has a problem with what I did. They were told to be angry, which is why they're angry in the first place. Um, but I'm, I stand by what I did. And if anybody can prove me wrong, please do, because I promise you the most money I'll ever make on a video is a video called I was wrong about leopard geckos and everybody will watch it. So I have nothing but dollars and cents to gain. If I was wrong, please send me the information. I'll gladly make a video on it. I think the other thing is like people were saying cohabbing is wrong. And then after I made my video, people didn't really say that in response to me. They just said like, yeah, but like there's a lot in there for that size tank. And I'm like, mm, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm a bit like habituated to it because I've worked places where there was like 30 and a four foot, um, <laughs> which I was like, That's Jesus. So, so when I see six, I'm like, right. It didn't like offend me <clears> to my core. But also how, how do you, how do we go about defining like how many, goes in a certain space it goes as like if you say that the minimum for like a leopard gecko is a 40 gallon then then how many is that in a that what's that like four in a in a four, four. Foot? Yeah. yeah but i think the thing is too when people say a 40 gallon well what if there's as much floor space as two you know as, mm. as because that's the thing is People say, why didn't you put shelves? Well, I put sticks, which act as shelves. Like, there's no shelves in nature. They're climbing on sticks. When they're basking, they're generally on the bricks or on the sticks. So I think that the number thing, and if you look at it too, when I'm looking at it, it and I see all six, they're so far apart from each other. There's no way that the one on this side knows the one over here is even there. So I think that the idea that it's crowded and I tossed a bunch of them in, 
is just silly goose stuff. And, and anyone who wants to try it, even if it's for five minutes, get 120, set it up like that, put six leopard geckos in, and I think you're going to scratch your chin and go, huh, this is not what I thought it was going to look like. I think it's really hard to argue because I feel like you can make points on either side, but either side's points will be weak because there's no science to support either way. The science only supports that they're social, and that's it. Mm-hmm. So they live in, they, shouldn't, they live in, yeah. So shouldn't we be like, well, I don't know, rather than I know you're wrong because of like, yeah. I think that the, it should be well, you know, if it works, then it does, you know, let's figure this out. Let's do an experiment thing rather than I know that no one's ever done it like this that I've seen, but I know because of it. I just feel like. Everyone's very absolute, and to me, that's just not a great way to move forward in the hobby. Well, I mean, yeah, you could it, have an eight, an eight foot, but then what if they're all on one side, all together, still in like four feet of space? You know. But on the yes. reverse, if you consider a three by two by two, like the minimum for one, I suppose by seeing an extra foot added and then six in there, that's probably why people have been like, "That's crazy." So mm-hmm. I, can, I can see both sides. Like, but I just think there's, a, I don't know that. I am not comfortable taking a hard stance either way because I don't have any like science to back my point either way, other than just like common logic of being like, well, 40 gallons goes into this, or it's just like, well, three foot's this, and that's only one more. But like, I don't have anything solid to like concrete to anchor myself to. I think the big thing too is that that a lot of people didn't acknowledge, as I said in, I think it was the second video, I've done this before, this exact setup. It actually looked a little prettier because it wasn't supposed to be, you know, everyone can do this. I, I put a little bit more time into it, but I've had six leopard geckos in a four by two by two before. I just never showed it on the channel because it didn't seem very interesting to my audience based on other cohab videos. So it's not like I just threw them in there and hope for the best. I've done this exact same thing with different individual geckos, but the same number and the same species and the same sex. So I, I just feel like experimenting is experimenting and I've done the experiment before. So it's not like I just did this and hope for the best. Mm. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to what's, what is the keeper experiencing in that scenario is the keeper experiencing animals that are healthy and thriving and eating properly and maintaining weight. Uh, I mean, I, I, you could use that argument to justify any care potentially, I guess like, Oh, he's doing fine. He, he doesn't need water, but you know, so there's, all, <laughs> you always have to take a consideration of what does the what does the scientific data say? Can we use any of that data to influence the care at, in any capacity? And then can, can then then it's up to the keeper to, to decide whether or not that's something that is working for them and and working for those specific animals. And uh, so I, I think that's a good place to start. I mean, you you take because you know providing UVB is a good example. Obviously, this is a drum that Liam has been beating for a long time, even in the podcast as well, talking about you know providing proper lighting so for our animals. About What's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So someone could say, well, I, I, I'm using my own keeper skills to look at this animal and it doesn't need UV because I've had it for 20 years and there's no issue. But then you back up and say, well, let's look at the, what does the, the scientific data say? Like, is, is there actually data that supports that maybe that it is a, a good thing to provide? And yes, and for the, the answer is for the most part, yes, for, for that particular example. And then you default to, okay, now let's see what the keeper is doing. So I think there's obviously there's different stages to this. You do have to rely on some data if there is a data available, but you also have to rely on what the keeper is how the keeper is keeping and the interaction they're having with their animals and giving them some benefit of the doubt that they're not letting their animals get torn apart. I find it, I find it very strange in the fact that it's awful that they're in like a, a forefoot that was complex that has like all the lighting. So should they be kept individually, but, but in racks instead then, or is, or is that no good either? I mean, like, I think you, kept in racks before anyway didn't you so why, why were you not attacked then but you're attacked now like arguably that's I, I can, I'll that answer your say, question miles off road. oh i know why because they were told to be bad because there was a big post by a bit someone with a big audience that said that they disagree with me and i don't think that he meant for that to happen but there was not one comment not one thing in my inbox before that that's why people got mad because they were told to get mad and it was one person and then it was the youtube channel and then now there's someone on TikTok, I guess, who just, and this whole thing has been put to bed, but I mean, let's use a YouTuber with a substantial audience so that I can get some clicks on my own name. So I think that it's just people who are looking for clicks, who are using it for recreational outrage. And then the reason that people got mad in the first place is because they were told to, because I've made videos with, that have millions of views collectively showing this exact same thing. And no one said, boo, all mm-hmm. of a sudden someone on Facebook says, I don't agree with this. And someone told me it was a sponsored post. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, and then all of a sudden now the the horde is out. So it was just because um, it's uh, they were told to be mad and, and they didn't really think for themselves and they just uh, jumped on the dog pile. Mm-hmm. Dogmatic lanes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, let's spend some time just discussing cohab in general. Like I, like I said, I know there's lots of people that are actually interested in this in this topic or this this you know method of keeping. We can call it. Uh, Ellie already mentioned a few of examples that she has in her place. I've never cohabed. I'm trying to think back in my memory. No, I, don't, I haven't ever cohabed at all, so I don't really have any experience with it. Um, Adam, do you want to? I mean, obviously, you have two retics behind you that are cohabbed, and they seem like they're uh, fighting a lot. They each have a gun. <laughs> I don't know how yeah. they got a gun, but <laughs> it's yeah, like a war I mean, going on. Yeah. Especially those laws here in Canada, they had must have got them on the black market in Toronto. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. For so one of those car being, thieves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of catalytic converters in my driveway every morning. I, I think it's the retex getting out. But, uh, <laughs> these, so I've got in this enclosure two super dwarf reticulated pythons. So both of them, one of them is about eight feet and the other one's probably nine foot, something like that. So they're, they're small animals. The enclosure behind me is eight foot by six feet tall by four feet wide. So it's about 1,500 gallons if you want to use gallons. Um, and in the enclosure, it's set up and there's lots of climbing opportunities. The one main branch actually fell down. So I got to put that back up. No retics were harmed in the making of this uh, video. And I've got four white tree frogs. I've got one Amazon tree frog and two uh, Felsuma grandis, so the giant uh, day geckos. And before, I mean, your comment section is going to blow up right about this point. But the reason that I did that is I've kept Amazon tree frogs and giant day geckos together for years. And the reason that I started to do that is because someone else I know has been doing that in an Exoterra 3x3x18 three by three by or whatever, like the big Exoterra, for like over a decade. And zero issues, no problems. They leave each other alone. They're, they're both big enough. They're not going to try to eat each other. They come from similar climates, although they're not the same part of the world. They're all captive bred. They're not bringing in, you know, wild parasites and things like that. So I figured, okay, let's try it with, the white tree frogs because they're a similar size to the Amazon tree frogs. Like I thought, no issues whatsoever. And then I've been to where retics are in the wild. I've studied them. I've talked to people who study them for a living. I understand them. And also I'm, I'm good friends with Garrett at Reach Out Reptiles and we've talked about retics a whole bunch too. So I'm not an expert on them, but I know that they're not going to be eating things like frogs unless they like they'd have to even if they were starving, I don't even think they would. Retex, in my experience, they look for a heat signature. Those frogs are not going to put off a heat signature different than the leaf that they're sitting on. They're going to be looking for something that, first of all, smells like a rat and has a heat signature as well. A lot of those uh, retex, if you don't warm the rat up, they'll strike because of the smell, but they'll miss almost every time. If they're warm, they don't miss. If I open the enclosure and it's feeding time, they're gunning right towards me. They see my heat signature and they're going to get me or not or get close to me anyway if I don't back up. So in that enclosure, I think it's plenty big. It's got tons and tons of, we're talking thousands of dollars worth of plants. It's got substrate. It is fully bioactive. It has UVB, as you can see on the top. It has basking spots. Uh, I'm really excited about the enclosure. I'm really proud of it. And I can't wait to, to show it up. It is a custom reptile habitats enclosure. They are not paying me to say that, but uh, I'm very proud of that enclosure. So, so the day geckos are in there as well? Yeah, so... Uh, uh, one just moved, but yeah, there is two day geckos in there as well. That's cool. And I'm just, just thinking the, the four foot depth is probably so nice. And that's something that you can't really picture until you see it because we're so used to two foot depth and maybe three foot, but you know, typically doors are two feet or three feet wide. So you don't go beyond that. So to have that four foot depth, it must just, that gives you so much more room. It's a it game like changer room from the camera angle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, it does. Yeah. This room is 400 square feet. And when it was empty, I remember when I first looked at this house before I bought it, I'm like, this is the biggest room I've ever seen. Now it looks tiny because I've got four foot deep enclosures here and I've got two of them over on that side that are just, they're four or three feet tall rather than six feet tall. And they're stacked on top of each other. But this enclosure is massive. And there's a picture on Instagram of me standing in it. And I'm a pretty short dude, but there's room and like, I can't, it is freaking huge. I could, I could cohab with another human in there and uh, it'd be just okay. I think, I mean, maybe not six humans, but it'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I mean, so I, I think it's actually worth defining cohabbing as well, as you were explaining it. I think you guys can let me know if you think these are the three versions there's, you can, you can cohab like species together. So you no know, conspecific species of the exact same. You can cohab animals that are, different species but maybe within the same geological range maybe that would be kind of more falling into like the biotope type type setup and then you can do what you've done here and cohab animals that are from totally different ranges but similar climates so you have different species but but similar climate and that that's also ver all three of those versions work as long as you do it properly and obviously in the fish world the aquarium world you see all of that all the time actually most of the time you see 
coha uh, different species from different parts of the world being kept together and that's a totally normal thing as long as the water temperatures and salinity and salinity and ph are all you know relatively the same so is does anyone is there any other versions of cohab i think that's it <laughs> isn't it funny though like in the aquatics world it's like that's normal cohabbing is normal but then you'll put some someone to put like a like a fin nipping species with like like a splendid or, or something like that. And it's like, oh no, not that cohab, because we know that one doesn't work. But then they don't go, no, to, oh, every cohab ever again. Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh, that doesn't work. Not that one, but this works. And they have rules and like what we figured out works. And like, yeah, there's here's entire our charts. Yeah, but in, in reptiles, it's like, if it goes wrong once, then it's like, let's burn the village down. Well, I think aquatics is so far ahead of herpticulture or just reptile keeping in general. I just think that they're miles ahead. And if you ever go to an expo that has an aquatics expo and a reptile expo, the difference in the way people speak to each other is just, it's a completely different thing. But yeah, I think in this enclosure, Dylan, to your point, uh, if you're keeping animals from similar habitats around the world, for example, tree frogs, these tree frogs are from Indonesia and Australia. So they are from the same place that these refix are from. But obviously the day geckos are nowhere near this part of the world. And then the uh, Amazon tree frog is nowhere near that part of the world either. So it's completely different places. However, if this didn't work, I don't know if you guys knew this, but Burmese pythons are doing pretty good in Florida. So it turns out that you don't need to be where they're from. Animals can do really great as long as you're mimicking where they're actually from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ellie, do you have any other cohab uh, situations? And you keep frogs as well. I don't know if they're all like species or, or what are you doing there? Yeah, I haven't mixed species. I've just got a tank of whites and a tank of white tree frogs anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> a tank of... Um... <laughs> Why do take these so The TikTokers are here. The TikTokers are here. You better be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was like the, the fax machine noise in my head before I actually got that. <laughs> no, I said it, then I was like, I better follow up with someone else. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've got a tank of Amazon milk frogs as well, but I haven't... Um, intermingled them at all we when i watch in shops we do it all the time everything mm-hmm. there would be yeah, yeah. like everyone knows dark frogs fell soon man, that's so common like um american tree frogs um green and owls and rough green snakes that's a common cohab that we do in the uk because it's like a little like florida biotope thing um that's done all the time um there was rattlesnakes and something once. I can't remember what it was. But it was on the walls. It's probably a gecko. Um, one time, someone accidentally put a royal and a healer monster together, and they did absolutely fine. Wow! <laughs> so it, there's, there's the shots. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so right, I, opened, yeah. I opened a rack and I went to put my hand in a hide um, to grab a royal um, to, to do something, and it was like I felt keeled, and I was like. The fuck is that? <laughs> and I was a healer. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing someone would have like put it in the wrong one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think too, the reason that we keep these animals in captivity in the first place is for our own enjoyment. I mean, mm. and people who say that, I promise you, unless you're wearing a lab coat, you're not studying these, you're not doing it to study these animals, right? So if you're doing it in a safe way, in this enclosure, no one's going to tell me it's too small for this enclosure or this setup. And there's other examples too. So, I mean, uh, Liam was just telling us about those examples. And, and other examples, I have emeralds, emerald tree boas that I'm going to put with dart frogs because they occur naturally together and one's not going to eat the other. But I think that as long as you're using common sense, for example, I wanted to put dart frogs in here, but I think the white tree frogs would probably eat them. So I don't do that. So I think it's just common sense. And as long as you're not doing something to endanger the animals, I mean, who's to say that you shouldn't do that in the first place just because they're not from the same place or whatever the case is. And I mean, with the Gila monster and the ball Python example, just because it, in your head, you think, ah, oh, it doesn't work. doesn't mean that it necessarily won't in the first place. Yeah. 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 So I think that's probably some good steps for people. I, I think probably the con specific cohab, the keeping of the similar, the, the like species together is probably the easiest step for people to, to start with. As long <laughs> as you're talking about a social species clearly. And because 
social animals typically are not going to be cannibalistic. They're not going to eat each other where you could have, you know, we, we see, you see horror stories of snakes happen all the time, even in breeding situations where the female eats the male and, and they're not even cannibals in, in the wild. Just that sort of thing can sometimes happen. So you take something like the stenodactylus, you know, they're not going to eat each other and they, they do work very well in colonies. That's kind of a great place to start. I imagine to, to just to develop your eye for what stress might look like in a social setting or, you know, you have, five animals that look identical you got to start actually understanding which body shapes or, or slight coloration differences so you can actually keep track of them like those are all skills that you can develop as a keeper if you jump right into the cohabiting different species together and frogs and snakes and then suddenly you have less frogs than you had earlier you know <laughs> you, you don't have the skill set in order to manage that but you, 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 you can actually ramp yourself up. So I imagine if, if somebody wanted to get into I don't know if anybody can answer this question if, if somebody wanted to get into cohabiting in some capacity do, do any species or, or, or actual, you know, setups come to mind for you guys? I think ones that are commonly done are probably a safe bet. Like, or even inverts, you can go um, the, oh. bless you. you, you can go the giant desert hairy Arizona s- the scorpions and the, the, the uh, blue death fanny beetles mm. or Felsuma and dark frogs is a really common one. Um, Anoles in in green tree frogs, um, eyelash vipers and tree frogs, uh, eyelash vipers and um, oh, there's a fel- felsuma coming down, uh, coming over Adam's right or left shoulder, whatever, whatever. Oh right, hello. There he is. Oh, that, it's oh. Grandis, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Grandis. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> when it was like, well, I actually go have Grandis, so you should listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? I should actually uh, reach out to that guy to see if he has any advice for me because he did read a 30-year-old book, so I know he knows what he's talking about, <laughs> which is great. Uh, but if you're if you're going to... Uh, <laughs> there goes the retech. If you're going to start cohabbing things, I think that maybe you should do the research and keep them separately first so you actually know what you're looking for and then just yeah. use a little bit of common sense and then speak to people who maybe have done it before. So if anyone reached out to me on Instagram and said, hey, you know what? I've got some grandest... And I've got some of these frogs and I want to put them together and I have this big enclosure. I'd be happy to talk to you and tell you how I did it and, you know, what to look for and what not to do. But don't keep like don't keep a frog species with garter snakes, you know, like just use common sense. Like make sure you're not putting things with eat with things that eat other things. And I think that this is a, a good example that I know I'm going to get set on fire for by people who have no other thought than you shouldn't co have things together. But I think that keeping like species together first is probably the best way to do it. And then if you want to do multi-species stuff, I would really do your research and really keep an eye on it and keep them in really big enclosures. Mm-hmm. I mean, I bought my um, my Lagodactylus conri to cohab it with my bull python in this setup behind me until I realized they would just walk straight out of the viv. Um, <laughs> then I put them in a glass tank. But I intended to cohab those two together. And you're like, oh, um, this thing is the size of a... <laughs> Like a thumb or like a thumbnail, yeah. Would walk straight out with a gap between the two bits of glass, <laughs> yeah. But our, our friend's got um Felsuma with his bow constructor, and that works well. So, I, yeah, I my think a lot of it works. Yeah, my initial I wasn't gonna put the retakes in here, but when I first thought of this, I thought of this years ago, and I sort of talked to Paul about this years ago. And what I initially wanted to do is I wanted to put red eye tree frogs with a boa constrictor and then dart frogs on the ground because they're all from the exact same place, make it a Costa Rican type jungle. And then I got the retics. I'm like, huh, that would be more fun. And retics have never shown in my, that I know of any sort of uh, cannibalistic nature where I have heard of boa constrictors, if they're vastly different sizes, or perhaps doing that. And it's easy to feed these guys because you just take one and you dangle a rat and you bring it out of the enclosure and you feed the other one in the enclosure. I thought it was just easier to do. So, yeah, I, I think that I'll probably get uh, destroyed for this. But then also I would invite all of you who comment on this to then go look at Mikey Busto's setup where he has literal predators eating other things. And it's the exact same size. And obviously his videos are much more cinematic than mine. But I just think that's another case of shooting the messenger, not the message. Some people get no criticism whatsoever. And then I've already had criticism on this about the leopard gecko thing. Did you see his enclosure where he's putting retex with frogs? It's like, OK, what's your argument? Yeah, and, and for people that are listening, that's the Ants Canada uh, video, yes. right? Or yeah, videos. yeah, sorry, yes, Ants Canada. Yeah, Mikey Bustos, Ants Canada, who's uh, lives in the Philippines, but his channel is Ants Canada. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I guess he's Canadian. Did he used but... to live in Canada. 
He must be. I think yeah, he's yeah. from so, Vancouver. No, he well, yes, sir. He is from Vancouver, but he lived in Toronto for a while, and then one of his family members is used to live like a block away from me here. So anyway, Mike and I talk off. I met him one time, and that dude's fan base is incredible. By the way, at Animal Con, there was you know there'd be fifteen people come to meet me. He had a line out the door and around the building to meet him. Like his fan base is so loyal. It's um, and he's also the nicest human being I've ever met. He is Canadian, so that checks out. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and he he's the, I haven't actually watched a lot of his those, those recent videos. I just haven't had the time, but they keep popping up. YouTube's like, you must watch this. They keep popping up on my homepage, and uh, it looks incredible. He has like a ridiculous multi species setup, including inverts, ants, and you know geckos and whatnot. And yeah, there is some real nature is metal things happening inside that enclosure that and it's presented yeah like the cinematography is i know he's got a team but who cares the cinematography if him and richard from tarantula collective made a video together i think the internet would explode like it's just it is so well done so well presented and it was really thought out so well thought out so they're long videos and i haven't watched them all but uh i encourage anyone who likes watching that sort of thing they're very good yeah yeah Ellie, do you have any other like things that come to mind as far as somebody starting out what, what what's a way to kind of get their their uh toes dip their toes into cohabbing without you know killing things i think as well taking on a social group that are already established so if you're really worried about how to introduce those leopard geckos together or if you're really worried about then get an established group already and then you're not having to worry that those animals are already bonded or at least you know that they have worked with someone else so they are more than likely to work with you as well Mm mm-hmm and another thing that, as you're saying, that came to my mind as well, I think there's probably three three ways cohabbing can go, right? It can be beneficial for the animals in the enclosure through a social setting. It can be probably neutral. Like, I'm sure those frogs don't care that there's retics moving around, and but it's not a negative thing for them because they're just, they're just doing their total their own thing. Or it can be an actual negative experience trying to cohabit together. So you do have to make sure that you're not, you're either neutral or positive, and that you're not just doing it just for your own interest, that there's... It, you know, if you can make it work in the neutral setting, that's totally fine. If you can actually make it work in the beneficial setting, that would be even better. But obviously, if if it's going to be a negative impact, that's not a good thing to do. But in, in many cases, the neutral setting is probably what cohabbing is for a lot of multi-species enclosures anyway. Drayton Manor. Sorry, Drayton Manor is another zoo that has um, anacondas and giant waxy tree frogs together. Interesting. Do, well, also, and, big snake, little frog works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it totally does. I mean, you see, like you said, you see boa constrictors and uh, and dart frogs all the time. I, did the, did the day geckos like spaz out at all when you when you first put them in there with the with the snakes? I remember when I when, when I had a day gecko, I swear that thing was like very sensitive when I took my snakes out of the enclosure. Just in the first couple of weeks, it was like, what the hell is going on there? It almost like it knew it had like a predatory response to the snakes initially. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure you can attest to those. Day geckos have a predatory response if you look at their direction. I mean, like they yeah. they did yeah. spaz out, and they and they still do. Like they'll be on the glass or whatever. And if one of the frogs get close to them, or the gecko gets, or the sorry, the other gecko gets close to them, they'll bolt. But I mean, they're not on high alert or anything. And I again, this is another species I've studied in the wild. I went to Madagascar to look for these animals. And I'll tell you what, you can't get close to them. How we ever caught them in the first place is beyond me because mm-hmm. we have people who do this for a living. That's all they do is take a bunch of you know tourists basically to look for these things. We could not catch one. We found that the uh, gold dust and the peacocks and all those, we found those get day geckos, but we couldn't get our hands on the falsuma. So they're fast enough that even it, well, if there was any sort of predation, I would remove them. But even if there was, I don't think that either any of these animals could catch them in the first place. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird how fast they are considering how short their legs are. Like the body plan for running is not there. <laughs> they teleport, man. Like if you, they, they, it's almost like you look at them and then they're over here. They teleport. Yeah, yeah. Like Huntsman spiders, they're crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, I think this is good. I mean, I think, like I said, the, sort of the positive side of this conversation is that I know this is a really interesting topic for people and there, there are ways that people can experiment with it. And I think just off the top of my head, I think of, you know, Liam had mentioned anoles or rough green snakes, things that are going to be like insectivores, I think is a pretty safe bet. You know, you're not dealing with anything that could potentially try to eat the the, the enclosure mate. Um there is so many different options of things that you can do. And, and maybe maybe snakes is maybe one of the harder ones because you could potentially deal with, you know, animals killing each other, but there's really an endless amount of options as long as the setup is right, the climate is right. And again, you're watching for that positive 
neutral or negative association with the other animals. As long as you're paying attention, I think it, it can work in many cases. I think the one thing you need to think about as well with co-having is if like a female gets overbred and that she needs that break, that's yes. enough consideration. So there's things like that as well. But mm-hmm. that takes experience yeah. to know that, I suppose. Yeah, and that's, I think that's a great point. And that's why in the leopard gecko example, it's only females. So I don't have to worry about them being overbred or anything like that. And then uh, Liam actually pointed in his video, if one starts ovulating, then I can change the behavior and things like that. And the same thing with my multi-species cohabs. I mean, there is a male and a female in my uh, emeralds, um, but the frogs that I'm going to put in there, I mean, they're dart frogs. They don't really, there's, you can put males together and things like that. And the same thing here. Uh, those tree frogs, in my experience, there's been no, the, all the tree frogs were together before and they're in a different enclosure that was much smaller. There was never any issue whatsoever. So yeah, I, I completely agree. How do you make sure that the frogs are eating? Do you just chuck crickets down or whatever you're feeding and then they eventually will find them? Yeah. I mean, I put worms in there and then they turn in, I mean, the, um, the larger frogs will eat the beetles that they turn into as well. And then I literally, you, you probably can't see it, but there's uh, calcium dust all over that back wall because I grab a handful of crickets and toss them in there. And that's basically <laughs> it. And then if I notice that they start to look skinny, which I have not at all, they've been in it three months now, I think, then I would just remove them and put them by themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a cool setup. So have you have you done a video on that yet or not not yet? Not yet. So I'm hoping for uh, April, but I wanted to do it as kind of, all my videos are very, you know, like leopard gecko video. You can do this today. This I wanted to do totally different from constructing the thing, putting the background on, letting the plants go in for a month and a half, which didn't matter by the way, retics will destroy your plants. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, kind of the evolution of it. So I wanted it to be about four months. We did this, I think starting in November. So I, I'll probably put the video out next month. Cool. Well, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, is there anything else in the co-having domain that anyone wants to mention before we wrap up? Have, have either of you bought the book, Social Life of Reptiles? Yeah, it's right here, but I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> I, I want to read it, but no, I just never I have time. I was going to ask you, what does it say? Because I've not. It's expensive, so I haven't bought it yet. But here, I'll hold it up for people. Yeah. He's like, I read. The, I read the cover. <laughs> it looks like a. It looks like the, a textbook, dude. The cover looks it great. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is like Isn't a textbook. It's like three hundred dollars. It's like silly. It, it was. What? It was. It was expensive. I don't think it was that much, but it was definitely over a hundred. Uh, and it was American, so Adam, you know what that's like. That's like a thousand dollars Canadian, and then you also you don't get paychecks for weeks. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the good thing is actually I'm going to rent this 1500 gallon enclosure out in Toronto for about a million dollars a month so I can <laughs> yeah. afford the book next month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For all those people in UK, there's like a TikTok. Speaking of TikTok, there's a TikTok account that's like Toronto real estate versus castles in the UK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's really? the exact exact same <laughs> price. And like one in Toronto yeah. is like a dilapidated house with spray paint on it. And then they're like, and then here's this manor with like a skate, like, you know, mountains and 30,000 acres wow. and a castle. Yeah. It's sad. So anyway, this yeah, book yeah. has a, a, a lot of information in it. Actually, I, it looks like I've started taking notes even, but. It was so long ago. I feel like I haven't. I have to re- read read some of it. I started reading it, but anyway, there's a lot of surprisingly a lot of information about s- social behavior in reptiles, which I guess isn't that surprising. Animals that have to mate with each other have some elements of social behavior. Obviously, doesn't mean that they're all living in colonies, but there's lots of weird evidence of or maybe it's not weird, but surprising evidence of mothers taking care of their young in the reptile space and or, or in reptiles uh, in general. So there's so much more than I think that we don't know and putting animals into a box which is what we do when we're keeping them in captivity does change things that that it that absolutely does change things you know you are reducing the size you're reducing the amount of areas or, or environmental or ecological niches that they can occupy but it doesn't mean it can't be done properly it just means that you do need to understand that there is a change that's happening when you do remove them from the wild which is you know pretty obvious but sometimes people need you know it needs to be said I think give people a bit of breathing room as well. Like, let's say someone tries something and it doesn't go right and it goes wrong. Don't obviously, like, cast them off the edge of a cliff and be like, you just have to die. <laughs> I think, yeah. like, I, I it think. It depends what it is, right? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I suppose in, interspecies cohabs are more for our benefit, I suppose, you know, in a weird way. Um, so people could argue that, like, you risk that just because you wanted to. But also, some things, like, I always I, the comparison I make is Boland's pythons, right? They're they're really hard to breathe, right? Breathe, breed, um, <laughs> and I think part of that is also because they don't get cold enough. But because they're so expensive, people are terrified to get them cold. Um, and they, they they might die. But what if you take them to like sub fifty, and that's what they might need? But everyone's too scared to. But 
if everyone knows that you've just bought a Bolands, right, and then you take it down to that to give it a go, see what happens, and it dies, everyone would absolutely pile onto you. Yes. But if no one's willing to go there, no one's going to be able to figure out the thing that makes it tick and then suddenly able, gives the information to everyone else and suddenly everyone starts reading them. So maybe that's not that thing for that species, but that example is what has created herpes culture in the first place because people have to figure that out. Yeah, I would just like to remark, I mean, in terms of cohab, if it's new to you or you didn't agree with it or you're just kind of looking into it for the first time, maybe just have an open mind about it. Maybe the thing that you thought wasn't true in the first place and maybe just ask yourself, this thing that I am so sure of, why am I sure? Where did I get the information and where did that person get the information? Where did it originate from? And uh, I think that a lot of people will change their minds or be open-minded. And the last thing is don't jump on someone because they're doing something different than what you do. It's so silly. And then using the term abuse is another thing too. Like, first of all, you're damaging someone's reputation when realistically, look up what, what the word means. And if you're trying something new or if someone's doing something different than you, that doesn't mean it's abuse just because you don't like it. So I would just say, have an open mind and uh, do some digging before you start. You know, I know this is wrong because I know it's wrong. Just challenge yourself. Why is it wrong? Yeah. Yeah. It's icon I worship. That's the problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm absolutely. starting to get like people will say things and I'm like, yeah, but because Liam said it. And I'm like, no, mm, 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 mm. Mm-hmm. like there's a reason that like, you need to like click the links in the descriptions for the papers and stuff. Whole reason I started my channel was to stop the whole like icon worship and things just slipping through the cracks as fact. And now people are starting to do it with me. And I'm like, no, stop. <laughs> but, yeah, and I say that all the time, <laughs> especially in care guides. This is a care guide. So that everything that I say, this should not be your only source. And yes, I label my videos, everything you need to know, but I'm playing a game. I want eyes on my videos, but in the video I say, don't just take this. And even with supplementation, I never talk about supplementation in detail in my videos because I'm not qualified. You should do your own research and figure it out for yourself. Do you do D3 twice a week or once every other week? It's up to you to decide and look at the scientific research and then confer with other people. For example, one of the creators who attacked me, I think most of the information is good for new keepers. So go to that person, go to a different person. Dylan, you have people on your podcast that I've listened to about leopard geckos who have different ideas than what I have. And part of the reason that I put the cohab out there is because I listened to one of your podcasts where someone who is very well respected was talking about cohab and no one had a problem with it. And then, uh, yeah, people had a problem with it when I did it. Yeah, Was that Dragoon Gecko? Um, no, I think what, what Adam was referencing is John referenced another keeper, I think in maybe a, probably a UK keeper or something, but had right. this kind of like open top, you might remember it was like an open top leopard gecko setup and it was the same, very similar. Right. It was like a, um, you know, um, like a harem of, of females, if you can say that about leopard geckos and yeah, it was just the, what was unique about it is it didn't have a top, but it was, it was a cohabbed situation that was thumbs up for everybody. Yes, I agree. Yeah, that's what it was. So now there's been a few people on your podcast. I mean, that one was over four years ago, I think. But there was one even re- more recently, and I forget the gentleman. He was an um, uh, English dude, and uh, he was talking about you know their natural behavior. They're not from deserts. I forget the guy's name, but it was a really good podcast. I listened to the whole thing. And uh, yeah, I just continue doing research, even if it's something that you're really confident on. Things change all the time. New information comes out all the time. Be willing to, to take in new information that challenges what you learned before. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I think that's a pretty appropriate place to, to wrap up. We should probably, I want to plug everybody's channel to make sure that everybody, like Adam just started his channel. He's just getting into reptiles. <laughs> so people make sure we get his down so people know where it is. But Ellie, do you want to start with yours? Because uh, you've just recently, you've actually just recently started a channel and I want to make sure people know where that is. Um, You just look up Hills Reptiles and I'm there, hopefully. There we are. <laughs> Good self yeah, There we go. <laughs> and Liam, everybody knows you, but you could probably just say it anyway. Uh, reptiles and research there's reptiles and research on there yeah <laughs> and here's adam, what it says on the tin <laughs> yeah 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 there's no uh, no false advertising and adam you can also uh, tell people about your other channel as well because that's a, a relatively new project yeah so but the reptile channel is wiccans wicked reptiles uh there's uh, a wiccans that's me that's my last name i don't fly on brooms or anything and uh, the reptiles are wicked that's where the uh, came from and then i have an, a new channel that started uh, a couple months ago called informal history it has really nothing to do with reptiles although i do reference animals in the, my most watched video and it's just explaining history in a way that people who maybe not are aren't history buffs or don't really want to get in the nuts and bolts of it can just enjoy things that maybe they didn't know before and just a fun way to explain historical events mm. 
Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I, I feel like when I saw you last in Toronto, which was maybe like 2022 now, you were, talk, you were talking about potentially doing something like that, right? Because the, the one thing with people that don't understand who don't have a YouTube channel is once you've defined your channel, there's no getting out of it. Like you're, you're kind of like in the grooves. And if you try to do a video that's different, uh, YouTube just says, never do that again. I'll show this to five people and <laughs> go back to what you always do. So it was that kind of the, you do lots of traveling for the reptile channel, but I know you wanted to show like more of the travel side, but it's kind of tough to do that. Yeah. So when I talked to you, in, so that was the middle of September, 2022. And then I already had a trip planned with Dave Kaufman and that was in October. And we went to Asia, which is where we studied retics and stuff like that. But I actually filmed more videos for informal history. And that was a year and a half ago than I filmed for the reptiles. And uh, I just not posting them all at the same time. Cause I think those are, the best videos and you know when you start a youtube channel it takes a while to so i don't want to just kind of like blow my load to say like all the good videos first i'm going to save them mm -hmm. but i did a lot of filming in buddhist temples and the most haunted place in uh in asia where uh, cab drivers wouldn't even take us and things like that so i was i'm really excited about the, the new channel and if anyone wants to go take a look you know let me know what you think and even if you don't like it let me know in the comments it's a brand new channel and i'm willing to take a lot of criticism at this point it's a cohab free zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Dave and I do cohab and we're different species for sure. But besides that, yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you all. This was a fantastic conversation. So thank you for joining me on the podcast. And I will absolutely have all of you back on at some point in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on, guys, and uh, I appreciate it. This was a really fun discussion. All right, that is the end of that episode. Finally, another round table in the books. Thank you, Adam, Liam, and Ellie for joining me on the podcast. I thought it was a really interesting conversation. You know, things always go differently when you just talk to people back and forth in you know real time obviously we're not in person doing this digitally across a zoom platform but it, it's a lot i think the, the the response videos going back and forth of the TikTok things it never really works it's not a very effective way for us to communicate obviously it's not how humans evolve to communicate you don't communicate by making your entire point and having the other person make their entire point and things get really disrupted very quickly we'll say so anyway i thought it was great to to have this conversation and cohabbing is a, a very interesting and also contentious thing in our hobby it's not something i've experienced experimented with i think it's something that i would definitely consider experimenting with in the future as long as you can do so in a, in a safe way so if you're somebody who's wanting to kind of get into the cohab space hopefully this gave you some tips about how to do that safely and where to start i think every each one of the guests today really had some good advice for folks who are wanting to do this so thank you all for listening to the podcast and again thanks to to our guests today for sharing such great information if you would like to learn more about the podcast make sure you head to animals at home network.com there you can find access to the show notes and every episode that has been released has a specific page for it if you would like to support the podcast you can do that financially through patreon.com slash animals at home if you do join the patreon you're automatically added to the discord server which allows you to chat with other like-minded keepers if you bump yourself up to the five dollar per month tier you'll have early access to episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. You can also check out customreptilehabitats.com, which is the show's sponsor. You can find an affiliate link in both the YouTube description or the show notes or the link in Spotify or any other podcast platform that you're using. That is an affiliate link. So if you do use that link and inevitably make a purchase off that website, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. Again, that goes to supporting the show, either funding my time for doing this or the equipment and the, the cost to edit and whatnot and whatnot. There are many things that go behind the scenes for running a podcast and all of that does help me make sure I'm doing it efficiently and effectively. And that is it for this week. I will catch everybody in the next episode.